A matte painting is a painted representation of a landscape, set, or distant location that allows filmmakers to create the illusion of an environment that is not present at the filming location. Nowadays, matte painting is widely used in VFX, animation, and game studios to replace the set and to design their various environmental elements. This week, I had an opportunity to interview Adrian. We've been in the industry for more than eight years, worked on both animation and movie pipeline to create matte paintings. He gave us a demo on how to create matte paintings and talked about matte painters in the CG industry. And he also gave a lot of advices, especially for students who want to be a matte painter. It's going to be a lot of information in this video, so take some notes and enjoy the session. History in Dublin. Um, I was about there for eight years and then I moved over to Toronto to work in the VFX industry. So I'm currently working as a matte painter over here on the expanse. I'm going to show some examples of that later. But um, I kind of want this chat to be a sort of a basic sort of overview for students because I don't know if people who are in this chat or how many people are actually students, but um, I kind of want it to be so students who can watch this video in the future might get an idea of what it's actually like to work in this industry, um, just how to get into the industry in general and just your everyday working environment because when I was in college, I had no idea what it was like to actually work as an artist. It was all completely new to me. Um, and I wish back then I had somebody to sort of show me what it was actually like to work as an artist, you know what I mean? Um, okay, you're all muted. <laughs> uh, um, okay, uh, so uh, Adrian, so can you talk about like, you know, um, oh, like as a matte painter, what's your role in a studio or like what exactly, you know, your work like job or stuff like, you know, you do in the studio. Can you explain a little bit further on matte painting? Yeah. I have some stuff, I have some stuff saved for later that I'm going to go through. Oh, okay, cool. But at the moment, I just want to sort of give a general view of what like a digital painter would do. Mm -hmm. Um, Adrian, yeah, go ahead. Okay. So as a, anyways, as a digital painter, I just wanted to go through some of the artwork that I do for a living. Um, like I've been started studying this for uh, probably like 17 years or so, and I wanted to kind of kind of showcase how it can be quite difficult for a student to get in their foot in the door, but they have to kind of just keep at it because I took me after college. It took me after studying for like five years. It took me another nearly five years to get my foot in the door of any studio. But um, so if any students is watching this and they're struggling, they might think it's hard to get a, a job. But just to keep trying, and it's something you're really passionate about, you. Will, keep at it and eventually you will get a start in the industry. Um, so I started in a studio in Dublin and we were um, an animation studio. So I basically was doing a lot of like bright and colorful sort of paintings, you know, hopefully you can see this. Um, so a lot of bright and sort of animation friendly like artwork. And um, it was what I was sort of studying at the time and sort of it was the, the job I got basically, I guess. Um, but then as the years went on, I got more interested in more sort of photo, uh, sort of photo, photo work, which sort of pushed me towards um, VFX, which is what I'm working in now. Um, so hopefully this, this little presentation will give a little overview of what it's like to be a digital painter, either in animation industry or VFX industry or games or whatever, like it's all digital art to me. So whether you're doing environment sketching or like vehicle sketching or like a characters and little vehicles and whatever, whatever you want to paint, that it's all just digital art. I don't really sort of categorize it as being a matte painter or being a concept artist or whatever. You're just interested in digital art. So you can do characters or you can do like costume designs, whatever, whatever you need to do. Because from my experience, you might be hired as a matte painter, but the studio will use you for whatever they can. And they will always need a concept artist. They'll always need you to do something. And every day you'll be doing something completely different. Like even working as a matte painter for the last two years in VFX, like every day, and like Zoe would know this, every day is quite different. Like one day you'll be doing a big environment design. The next day you'll be adding like a big crack on a wall or something in the background of a shot. Or Zoe might be adding blood or something, you know? All the stuff that we have to do in the studio. So you never know what you're going to be doing in the studio. So it's best to prepare yourself to be just a, a good all-round digital artist, really. And I've been studying this for crazy, crazy number of years. Like, I think I discovered digital painting back in like 2003, something like that. And it started to become pretty big online, with, uh, like, uh, what was that called? Like Star Wars episode two, 
No, the Attack of the Clones one, the, the really old one, the, the prequel mm -hmm. movie. So that's when I first started seeing digital art being used as concept art. I think a lot of people did back then. So that blew my mind back then. But it took me so, so many years of studying it to even get better as an artist. Um, so you'd be studying like software, like Corel Painter, Photoshop, trying to be a better artist and trying to be as good as what you're looking at online. But then you realize you're just not a very good artist because you didn't study fundamentals of art. You know, you kind of dive straight into the, the digital world and oh my God, all these amazing paintings online. And if I can use Photoshop, then I can be just as good as any of them. But then you realize after a while that you can't because you didn't really learn the basics. You know, you have to go back and learn the basics of, of art, which I neglected a lot in my college days. You know, I, I wanted to learn 3D modeling and texturing and all that. So I, I neglected my my perspective studies and all that stuff. So this this whole talk, I really wanted to be about students who might be feeling the same and they might look at artwork online and go, wow, that's amazing. I could never do that. But they don't see all the sketches behind it. They don't see the years of studying. Well, and I want to kind of show some stuff later that might kind of embarrass myself, which is how bad I was back then. So like even now, I'm just constantly learning. Like I look at a lot of my work now and I'm like, Ugh. like I, I take out a lot of my portfolio and I try to refresh it every few years. Because if you're an artist in general, you, you get better the more you do it. And after 17 years, I, I think I, I want to be pretty decent. Give up. So Adrian, um, uh, I have a question. Um, uh, like so far, what you showed, like you have uh, like a bright, uh, bright background, like matte painting or a concept art. So you have like both spectrum, like animation and VFX, like realistic stuff. Like how did you transition? Because some people who do animation, it's really hard for them to transfer to VFX. So how did you like manage to get into both spectrum? <clears throat> yeah, that's, that was kind of it. Like um, when when you're working in an animation studio. Like, it's a very stylized look that you like. It was a lot of fun. Like I, I know I loved working in animation. I worked in some of the best studios in Dublin, in Brown Bag Films. And mm -hmm. Shout out to you guys. Um, but I loved it. But but I also, as just as a, my own personal taste, I, I was in love with like Blade Runner and Alien. And like any concept artist will tell you how amazing they are. And you start to wonder, like, how do they do that? Like, how do you how do you make something look so real? And it's a completely different to what I've been doing. But so, and then even though I was working in the studio full time, I was always studying at lunchtime. I was one of those people that don't, that don't have to eat, so I can just sort of study during lunch. You know, yeah, kind of look lucky that way. But I always like studying, just looking at VFX breakdowns. And I actually have a want to show you something later when I get past this. <laughs> if I get past. Um, but it was more to do with how I wanted to get into that. And but during lunch, I would always be practicing. Like I would practice. This. I was doing this stuff in my animation days, just from watching what other people were doing online. And I was, because I'd worked in animation and I'd studied animation, I had some very basic 3D knowledge. You know, I could work in Maya. I could do on texture work. And I eventually actually became like a texture lead. You can believe that. But uh, so I had some experience with that. But I, I was, I don't know how you bring that into a VFX world. Um, so, I, so I just kept studying and studying, practicing, painting over 3Ds, over 3D just using photos in general. Like I didn't paint these files either. It's a photo, you know? So you want to make something look photo real, you use a photo. Um, and your painting skills that you get from your years of studying the fundamentals helps you sort of blend it all together. And then you work with compers, whatever, and make the shot look awesome. But it's all just studying. Actually, it's all just art to me. It's just digital art, um, which I've been fascinated with for the last 17 odd years. And I've only been pretty decent at it for the last maybe five. <laughs> I think but you were uh, too humble to uh, say that, but like your work shows, like, you know, it's really amazing. But um, like when you talked about, you know, uh, developing your artistic skills, like, do you think uh, like a digital painter uh, uh, should have like a traditional, like a strong traditional background? I, I, I don't, like I'm a terrible artist. I admit that completely. I don't do a lot of traditional painting. Mm -hmm. I didn't even like art that much when I was young, but it was the only thing I was good at. But it's only when I got into uh, college, and I discovered digital painting. Uh, it kind of was more about being a part of a team and helping create a shot. And working in animation, you're kind of working on the background. Mm -hmm. and the background is not the main thing. It's uh, you're just sort of, sort of helping the animation. On. But so, yeah, I, I don't have a traditional background. Like I, I spent many years just studying uh, traditional techniques, like just learning the basics, the fundamentals of art, like value and lighting, and composition, and but bringing that into a digital world. Like I, I can paint a pretty decent painting. In a few hours, 
if you give me a piece of paper and pencil, I'd be lost. You know, I want to try and undo it. Um, so it's all everyone's different. You know, a lot of amazing art concept artists are brilliant traditional artists. It's just never been me. Mm -hmm. um, but um, anyways, after after doing this for a number of years and getting more interested in sort of matte painting, and I wanted to sort of challenge myself because I've been doing animation for a number of years, and I've been looking at all these amazing VFX breakdowns. And you, you kind of start to think, you can can you actually work in VFX and can you change from animation to VFX? And I don't really, haven't really met many people who do that, but maybe they, they do. But uh, I haven't really talked to many people. Um, so Ben, I'll show you something. Hopefully you, you can see this. Um, you can see this Photoshop? Yeah, we can see it, yeah. Okay, so this is kind of the images that changed course of my life, <laughs> I guess. Blade Runner, but, uh, yeah. Obviously Blade Runner 2049. And this is some... Uh, just a VFX breakdown from a uh, frame store. Um, but so I, I was working in animation and I was so interested in VFX and you would look at like these um, mind blowing matte paintings from like Star Wars or Lord of the Rings or something like that and think you could never do that. I don't have the skills to do that. But well, when I seen these, I remember, I remember the day I even looking at these and just as, a, as somebody who had been a digital artist for so long and looking at the, just the sort of beautiful simplicity of these matte paintings with just the sort of set extensions and building the distant elements and looking at the on-set shoot, you know, this is <clears throat> like a real, like well, how, how they shot it on the day and those who work in VFX know exactly what all this is. But if you don't, like this would be quite alien to you, but like a, they would on the day they would shoot this shot and then they would give it to the matte painter to change the sky and remove the buildings and like this is like a crew area. Okay. And then you see the shot in the film, in the movie, sorry. <laughs> and you see just how the, they put on a very subtle sky, they removed all these elements, and they added a very subtle sort of, um, like architecture or like distant mountains or whatever, and it's a lot of pretty low res image. I look at this, I was like, well, I could do that. Like, that's not like a, a beyond me. I, I've, I've worked in Photoshop many years, like, I know my way around it. And I, I looked at these and went, yeah. So it's kind of, now it's time to try VFX. And, it's the same with all these shots. You see these like the shots are like stunning and beautiful, but they're very subtle. Like the just the whatever elements the matte painters are adding are they don't over empower the shot. Like they're not huge, big epic mountains and you know, it's subtle. Like it's, it's beautiful shots. So you look at like what they shot on the day, like they probably shot this in a quarry. Well, I don't know where they actually shot this movie, but you know, it looks like it was shot in a quarry. And uh, so the matte painter came along and just they didn't, didn't even do much to the sky. They just sort of subtly removed the element and added in stuff to help enhance the shot, like not over ticked, over empowered the shot, you know? So that really fascinated me. And that was sort of the turning point for me to go, okay, it's time to try VFX, you know? I sort of done animation for quite a while. And same with all these shots. Like I, I don't look at these shots anymore and say, I could never do that. Like you look at, this is another plate that was shot on the on location, wherever they shot it. And you can see all the distant, trees and houses and people wherever they shot this and then i actually don't know why this green screen is here i think the car might land or something in this shot but the map painter came along and removed all this and replaced it with very beautiful little mountains and this sort of architecture that really sits in with the plate or you know the live action plate then you see all this sort of stuff built so they must have tried i'm not sure if this was actually shot in a real scrapyard or they just sort of built this maybe they built it but uh you can see all the sort of junk that the matte painter would sort of come along and clean up. And, and it's sort of a, one of your day jobs in, as being a matte painter, you're going to end up doing stuff like this. You know, so you're, you're not painting big epic Star Wars uh, matte painting. You're just sort of helping to make the shot look pretty cool, you know. And you're doing whatever you have to do to make the shot look cool. And your, your matte painting is just another element to the shot. And that's what I found very interesting about it, you know. Nice. Hey, Adrian. So um, I have a question. Um, um, so you said like you jumped from animation to VFX. So it's kind of like a you know a contradiction. But like, do you like animation more to work on more animation, or are you geared towards more into VFX now? Well, I like both. Like I, I left animation just to sort of challenge myself. Like I, I literally, I never worked outside of Ireland. I literally hopped on a plane and moved to Toronto to work in this on the work on the expanse. So I've never been in Canada before, never worked in um, 
VFX before, so I just came over on my own because I wanted to challenge myself as an artist. I think a lot of artists might feel the same. Um, but I, I love animation. I still I talk to all my friends in the old studios and we get together all the time. Hello, Tim. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I, to me, it's all the same, like working in animation, working VFX. It's all digital art. Like you don't really, I don't really sort of mix the two. Like we, there are some things that are quite different. Like we work so much with photographs. Like if I find myself painting too much, then I know I'm not doing it properly. Like if, if I'm painting too much, it, it's going to look like a painting. And that's why it's hard for artists to see. Like a lot of my work, you look at it and go, well, that's a photo, you know, but I manipulated the photo to create something new out of it. Um, and you kind of learn a lot of techniques. Like, like in animation, I would never have to use photos too much. It's more, I'm afraid to bring up the, the other little you know, links to the thing, but uh, I mean, the, like if you're looking at like a um, sort of more cartoony style, like there is no texture work here. There's no overbearing sort of photos, you know, which is its own style. And so it has this beauty in that too. And I always liked working in animation, but just myself as an artist, I started to feel, you know, you start to feel that something inside you is like, oh, it's time for a new challenge. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I like both. And it's all because it's it's just art, you know. I, I like digital painting. Like I, I love digital painting as much now as when I discovered it for Attack of the Clones, you know. Uh, I'm very old. Nice. But, uh, yeah, so that's kind of it. And so then, so then you kind of, you suddenly, you, you make the transition from, VFX into, or sorry, in animation into uh, VFX, and I kind of wanted to show um, what you might actually expect to do on your say your first job on the in the VFX industry. That might be quite different to somebody who works in animation, or especially for students. I, I want this mostly to be for students who might be studying 3D animation, but um, or they're studying just art in general, and they're thinking of working in the industry. And what would I actually you actually do in the industry. Like I, I, when I, I landed here on a Friday and by Monday I was given my first assignments and tasks and you're like, okay, so hopefully I know what I'm doing. But all my years of ex ex study kind of got me there, got me to the point where I, I kind of knew what I was doing. Um, so well, actually before I show you that, I just want to show a quick little thing that I was sort of studying myself. Um, so I, I do a lot of painting, but when I was working in animation, I sort of started experimenting with thinking about my own plates. So in, in the industry, we have like a plate. You're given a photograph, and we're, we're going to extend it, or we're going to do something else with it. So on the day they would shoot with the footage, like maybe the shot is taking place here, and there's a the actor standing here, but they shot this in an alleyway somewhere, and they want to change the background. So that's a what we call it, like a set extension or something like that. So here would be me just sort of, this is still me working in the animation industry, but training myself to try what, what it might be like to work in the VFX industry, just from information I'd seen online and VFX breakdowns. So then I kind of go through the process of sort of cleaning up the plate, adding in new elements, like completely bringing in new photographs and sort of extending this all into the background and making something new out of it. But I'm not really painting, I, I'm sort of manipulating other photos and even back in the back end, you know. So it's not, not a great example by any means, but it's a similar idea to what I even do to this day. You, you'll be given a play to work on, and it's up to you then to try and make something that works for the shot. You know, does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. So one more question um, based on what you showed, the set extension and everything. So uh, do you, like, I also see, like, nowadays, matte painters use a lot of 3D elements. So, like, do you guys, like, usually do a lot of 3D elements or you get, like, uh, from asset department or you guys have freedom to uh, create your own 3d while you're doing 3d extension like set extension or something else yeah yeah um well sometimes i get to do a lot of got to do some 3d elements but we have a lot of pretty good 3d artists in our studio mm -hmm. and sometimes like we i am predominantly a 2d map painter in, in our studio we're a kind of a small 2d map painting team mm -hmm. but there's many 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 situations where because i'm able to work in 3d i'm able to go into maya i'm able to set up the lighting i'm able to import geo you might have a, a, a set extension to do and so i would just bring in elements and put them in the background and do some basic renders but i'll always end up bringing it into photoshop and it sort of helps helps kind of make it more realistic i guess because you're not painting but you're using the 3d as a a good foundation to add your photos on top of it so it's a very very useful tool to have to be able to jump into 3d um, like I, i'd recommend any artist who's looking to get into the industry whether they're doing like concept art or matte painting, 
to learn 3D as well. Like uh, my portfolio again, that I'm probably sick of showing you, so I won't show you again. But uh, it's like um, I do a lot of like kit bashing. I do a lot of character sculpting. Um, anything at all, anything to do. Uh, currently, I'm learning like Unreal Engine and Houdini, and we're going to be looking into Clarice and anything at all that makes the process easier. Mm-hmm. Uh, and as we as we move forward in in map painting, like even in the last two years since I've been here, I've seen Photoshop being used less and less and less. It's becoming it's not it's not useful to us anymore because people are rendering full environment scenes and it's just faster to render these days and what whatever reason we're jumping into unreal engine and whatever so photoshop is becoming less useful so in even this short of time i found i sort of feel that photoshop is sort of slowing us down a bit i find it quite difficult to sort of like we were, but uh, you sort of you sort of um you have to kind of keep up with the modern day sort of software and you have to keep yourself ready to jump into different software and not just be a 2d artist i guess and mm-hmm. um, so yeah and so from that anyways so i you, you get your job in vfx you're straight out of college it's your first day in college your first day on the job and what what are they going to actually give you to do so this is a little thing i wanted to show hopefully i'm allowed to show if i'm not okay but uh, this is some this is a plate from the expanse Hey, uh, Adrian, before uh, you're moving on this, and uh, I have a question from a uh, person like uh, from Mohsin. Uh, can a graphic or designer uh, or artist with uh, advanced photo skills shift to uh, matte painting? Or uh, does one need animation and VFX experience to make the shift? I don't think so. I, 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 everything I learned in 3D, I mean, animation was helpful, but I sort of learned it all on my, my own. So whatever you're into, whatever sort of art you're into, as long as you can use Photoshop, you, know, you can do whatever. Really. There's no no sort of limitation on it. Like any graphic artist or illustrator can learn to do this. Like it's not a rock okay. Cool. Thank you. Um, so, yeah. Okay, carry on. Yep. Yeah. Hey, thanks, Venki. Uh, guys, if you guys have any questions, uh, you guys can put it in the chat, and Venki will uh, read it for us. So he's my co-host today. Yeah, Adrian, you can uh, proceed with it, yeah. Okay, so so you might be out of college, straight out of college, and you've sort of been studying your artwork for a number of years. You're doing all the things like in my portfolio where you're studying environment designs, doing your studying perspective, and you're studying all of that. And then you, you finish college, and then you're, you land your first job in the studio. You know, and this is strange for me too, because even though I've been teaching myself, um, you still, you, you kind of wonder, well, what what do I actually have to do? You know, I wanted to kind of showcase an average day in a studio, you know? Um, so this is something you would be given. And this is a plate, would be similar to the plates that we've seen, Blade Runner or whatever. But this is what you're given, and you're sort of told that we need to create a big environment in the background. Um, and off you go, do what, do what you have to do. So you'll be looking at it going, well, what, what do I do? You know, especially if you're straight out of college, you're kind of, you'd be kind of a bit like, intimidated by that and so i was when i first came over i was like wondering to myself well, could i actually do it but just just through for my own studies and from my own experience and, and and working in animation prepared me a lot for working in a pipeline of course so i wasn't intimidated by being a part of a production pipeline like we're it's all the same like everyone is pretty much a very similar pipeline we all have our modelers and texture artists and our reviews and our art directors and it wasn't that it was more of a can i actually do it as, a, as an artist and could i actually you know, it was the challenge that I came over here for. But I just want to show what you might actually do um, or what, what you might actually do in your first day. So when you're given a plate like this, you might be wondering, well, I, I'm going to just have to, like, you'll probably have to start adding, like, some mountains or something in the background. The whole idea of this was to make, a, like, a set extension or like a full environment design for this. And... Um, but you kind of sit down and talk with your VFX suit or whatever, and you have an idea of what you have to do. It's not like completely, you know, we have a, you're given a basic script to work from, and we had a, we knew that this was a shot in a in a quarry in Toronto, I believe. So I had a lot of photos and everything to work from. I wasn't just making it up out of my head. We had to make up a sort of alien planet that they land on called Illus, and I knew that they would be landing on a cliff edge somewhere down here, and then I, I had to sort of make up what's back here and some mountains and clouds or whatever. But the, the first thing you have to do really is uh, kind of start working on the plate and get a more of a 
more of a technical side of it, you, will, you need to extract the elements so you can paint behind this. Because at the moment, if I start painting, you know, it's, it's literally behind. I want to be able to paint behind these elements, like the actors and the set. So this is a real world set. So the first thing you have to do really is extract it. Um, so it's, I'm going to do a pretty terrible thing about it here, but you try and find the channel with the most contrast. And we're, we're trying to try and make a, the elements that I want to extract, we make it really dark. And then we, our white points, we make it as bright as we can. So we're sort of building a little sort of selection for us. And if you've done it, if you spend a bit of time on it, you can extract your, your elements from the paint. Now, if I create a new layer and start painting, I can paint behind this now, so it's all, it's all good. So that would be like the first thing you would have to do. So even if you're thinking, worried about what's the design going to be or what am I going to paint, you, you can just sort of start doing the sort of technical part of it first, just get your, your plate sort of ready to work. And so now you're ready to start adding in your elements and you have to work out like your perspective grid would be the next thing to sort of really think about. You can't just start adding in and building buildings randomly. They have to fit into the scene. You know, you have to fit into the perspective of the scene. So again, it goes back to all your fundamentals that you learned in college. Hopefully, you paid attention and you uh, kind of taught yourself over the years. But you want to start thinking about perspective. So, I, what I usually do, and it's kind of a common thing to do is I will follow the lines that are already in the set. So this might be quite simplistic for a lot of us, but it's for students, like it's very useful to sort of just, it all comes back to the fundamentals and you're just sort of figuring out based off these elements of where all these lines are converging. So it's the kind of the very basics of, of perspective, but it all makes sense when you're actually on your day job and you're actually doing it for, you know, you've, you've got an art director or you've got somebody you have to answer to and you have about maybe two or three hours to create something and submit it. So you, you just sort of fall back on the fundamentals to kind of get you through. You sort of block in your perspective and then you're sort of ready to go. And then you then it's all about getting photos and getting the shot ready and doing what you need to do to get it working. And so this is, this is what I pretty much did on my first day in VFX. So, and to me, it wasn't that much different to what I've been doing in the animation industry. It was just a different sort of style, different, a lot more photo or oriented. Um, so I'll just sort of show what I ended up actually doing. Now I, I'm not going to, so this, this will be like, this will be one of the first things that I, I did in my first day. So I did the exact same thing. I extracted, I actually added the Rossi ship very poorly, but it's just there just to make it look better, I guess. And there's a bit of color grading going on, so it would match closer to the style of the show. But this will be the first submission that I had done. And it's a bit sloppy when you kind of look back on your older work and you cringe a bit. But for my first day, it wasn't too bad. I was happy enough with it. So then you you submit it for review, and then you get a ton of feedback. And you, usually, your first thing you submit is never going to be exactly what they want. But it's always good to submit something as quick as possible. And you cannot just sit there all day and worry about it. And you know, this is like a real world situation where you're they're paying you to create something, and you, if you sit there worrying about it too much without getting feedback or help from you know, artists around you, you, it can be quite a stressful day for you. So the idea is to block in something as quick as possible and then get it in for review as, as quick as you can. And as soon as you start getting feedback, then the painting starts to come together. And this is still like a concept, but you would spend a few more hours on it and make a final looking matte painting. I think in the final shot, we did a lot of this stuff in CG. And then the matte paintings ended up being like sky elements and distant mountains and all that sort of stuff. But um, but for now, it was just locking in a quick, we call them style frames, I guess. But um, so then you, you submit that and then you get notes and you look at the notes and read them and go, okay, cool, I kind of know what you do. So based on the notes, I come up with the second option, which is like cutting in more mountains and whatever and making it a bit, this is a bit sort of sloppy and whatever. But this one looked a bit better. I was quite happy with it. So again, these are all elements taken from quarry in Toronto. So I didn't have to do too much with it. It was, you could sort of, bring them in and paint them up and make them look nice and the moon and all that sort of jazz. Then you submit it again and go, okay, this is looking pretty awesome. Quite happy with this. And you submit it and you will get notes again. And that's kind of the nature of the beast. You kind of, you get your submission in as quick as possible and then you'll get feedback 
and then you move forward. And then you say, then you do your next pass and you get more notes. <clears throat> and then we decided to do something more like this because it was too open. Like the, some of the notes I would have got was like, there's just too much space here. Just to fill it in a bit. So the idea is that the theater, like um, the, the ship is sort of sitting on the edge of a cliff. So they landed on this cliff. The ship is standing here. They're getting off and walking in this direction. And so, but behind them, that's what I'm painting here. Then we decided to sort of just fill in the back area so there's another cliff behind us so we don't see too much of this. It's a lot of work <laughs> to make it look good. So we wanted to fill in as much as we could. And so we went to something like this. So after getting notes, I moved into more like this, which is getting closer to how it looks in the final shot. Um, so then we saw, so I, after taking my notes, I knew how to sort of build up another area in the back, um, add a new mountain and into this is pretty cool. This is kind of close to final. And at that point, then you're happy. Everyone's happy. Like your art director, your VFX suit guy, is, <clears throat> he's, he's happy. And if he's happy, I'm happy. You know, that's just the whole thing. And so then you send it to the client, and then you get more feedback. You know, and you get notes. You get notes from them. And um, usually they like what everything we do because, you know, whatever. <laughs> so you get notes from them, and so we start making some revisions based on what they give, the notes that they would give. And not that, not that much would change. And then this was pretty close to final. So then after about a day, so this will be about a day or two's work. And then you, you send this in off to the client and hope that they like it. And you move on to 20 more other shots that you have to do, you know? So that's kind of the basic sort of workflow of working VFX. And it's quite different to what I would have done in animation, but similar though, you know, it's all perspective. It's all lighting, composition, learning your fundamentals of art. Um, and that's kind of it. <laughs> so that would, be your, that would be your first day. And I just kind of wanted to give a basic overview of just to give some idea of what you might do after college and getting into the industry. Because when I was leaving college, I had no idea what it was like to work in the industry. And back then, there was nobody you could actually talk to or get some information from. It. So you're kind of, on your first day, you're like completely lost. And you know not, nothing about a production pipeline or anything like that. <clears throat> yeah. Hey, so Adrian, so when you did this shot, like um, you just jumped on it to, uh, you know, like grabbing in photos and everything right away, or it just like did like a uh, like a like thumbnail sketches so where you can see like how the composition works and everything, or you just jumped in. Well, well actually, it's a good question. See, for these, I just jumped straight in because I've been kind of doing this for so many years. Like, I don't like show you this. So this is a kind of a basic way that an artist might work. You, you can see this, okay? Yeah. And this is a basic way that I would work. Like I do crazy amount of little sketches, you know, on my free time. And these are little kind of comp sketches. They're a mixture of they're a mixture of like photos and just painting. And so some of these are like absolutely dreadful. But you sort of do them just to get an idea of what you're doing. You, you know, you don't just, I don't just work on one painting. I usually like to work on multiple at the same time. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's quite freeing to sort of jump between one and you're, you're fixing something. Something isn't working and all the time you're, you're painting on this one, the eye is actually looking at this one. Going, what can I do to fix that guy? You know, it's, 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 it's not about making you know, like 16 beautiful images. It's, it's all exploration, and trying, out, trying out different things. And, and even from doing all this, they were all absolutely dreadful, but it was only like a lunchtime that I spent mm -hmm. at that And at this guy started to make a bit of sense to me. I thought it was looking kind of cool. And it had some nice shapes. And, and this one had some potential. And so all, and all the rest of them would just get completely discarded. But it doesn't matter. It's, it's all a study. So I would take this painting, and then I would, I would work into it more. And it would end up being like this painting. So like this is by no means good, but it was it came from that little sketch session, mm. you know, you block in some certain of this. So this is you do this for a number of years, you kind of get the feel for what works and what doesn't work. Mm. So my personal work, I, I like to paint like multiple paintings. I have ridiculous amount of examples of just working on multiple images at the same time. Like these are not these are not all come together. These are literally just one document, one layer. Mm. Well, it's actually flattened, but I have a layer on top that has like all the just to sort of break up the images and I would just start painting. And the more you do this, you kind of get better at it. So I would I would recommend artists to sort of like to concentrate on these little sort of sketches that they're not 
nothing like they're sort of a bit weird and whatever you can kind of create some interesting shapes out of it because you're not really trying too hard to make something cool yeah. so when, when it comes to comes to actually working when you're doing something like this you've kind of got a good feel for what works you know you're not i didn't have to do too many little sketches i just sort of jumped straight into it but that, that just comes from experience so if you're like a, a student or something you would maybe you would it would be better to sort of do multiple multiple little sketches and i know a lot of artists they do lots of little thumbnails mm. and i tend i tend to work with a lot of color and whatnot i don't do little grayscale sketches or whatever and it all depends on what you're doing you know if you're like, um, so, like the sh uh, the sketches you showed us, uh, you know the thumbnails you do. Um, like, how do you come up with colors? Because you know, for some people, color might have different you know hardships. Because some people can do really good in grayscale. When it comes to colors, they usually have a hard time doing it. So, how did you like you know as a matte painter or as like digital digital painter, how they can increase their color sense or the color scheme to come up with the color scheme? Well, I think it's always good to just look at artwork that you like and just different sort of like artists that inspire you that are you know you kind of like their color palette or there's a movie you like and you just study study the color palette and um, as for like getting it colorful like uh, there's a lot of photo bashing happening here and you just sort of overlay i don't really have anything here to really do anything with it but um I, I like to just grab random like photos and throw them in you can see this is like a bird you know it doesn't make a lot of sense but if you bring it into photoshop set it to like soft light, it, it sort of, if you have a grayscale image, you can overlay photos on top of it. And I don't care the fact that it's a bird, I, I care about the colors that I'm getting from it, you know? Yeah. It doesn't work too well on this, but you, you would study, study colors, and color is a huge different, you could do an entire talk about color. But uh, yeah, I, I kind of do work on it in different ways. Uh, I will just sort of either study from artwork that I like, <clears throat> and you can actually just sample from those from the paintings and see what works together and then create your own. I, I don't really tend to work in grayscale and jump into color. I like to just work in color in general. Um, but there's many, many different ways. Like say, like I, I do I do a lot of little, like vehicle sketches and whatnot, but say this is a little grayscale image. <clears throat> and if you wanted to add some color to it, you would just sort of, well, this might be a bad example, but um, usually you can just sort of use a, like a, colorize this and you get it looking horrible but you can just invert this and then you know, um, sort of add the color in gently so i had a huge swatch of red there but now i'm just sort of painting over it softly into this mask with a huge saturation layer on top of it and then i'm introducing color top of this and it's very basic so you just mm -hmm. create a new pair and maybe put a multiply layer and make it darker or whatever and you might create a layer with like color dodge, which is kind of useful for vehicles. And you would enhance the color with a bit of sunlight hitting it. So although it is a grayscale image, you're, you're, it's, it's quite easy. Once you sort of get used to Photoshop, you can, and I would overlay photos on top of this and you work from there. So some artists work in grayscale. I, I tend to jump straight into color, but that's, it's, you know, it's just from my experience, you know. Nice. Those are uh, quite uh, interesting uh, sketches you have there. Hmm. So, like, how do you usually like come with thumbnails like this? Like, do you use like some lasso tools or something like that? You just like. No. This one actually is weird. This is this is using a, a website called uh, Webkami, oh, which okay. is an awesome, mm -hmm. awesome little tool for generating lots of really cool little shapes. shapes. Oh, nice. Yeah, so you use it. That's why there's so many here because you can just do this in about ten minutes. And you just sort of, it has a, it's like a lasso tool that just sort of creates these you, you just sort of paint in the software and it makes these really nice hard edges mm -hmm. and if you're weird like me you will see little vehicles and you can sort of just start yeah. touching on top of these and you start to see you add the cockpit and you start figuring out the different shapes but like for me as an artist i find it difficult to sort of just sit and sort of sketch out yeah. the vehicle it's usually quite generic i find my my, my work can be quite generic if i I just sort of sketch, mm -hmm. you know. So that's why I like to use anything at all. Like, you know, I use 3D or I paint over a 3D model, but uh, you do whatever it takes to get an interesting design going. And for me, this is just like a fun experiment with shapes. And you find some shapes that work and some don't, but it doesn't matter. It's nobody's ever going to see them. When you find one that works, you work into it. And an hour or two later, you have a pretty cool design. Nice. 
Okay, uh, so far so good. Okay, guys, uh, do you guys have any questions based on what our uh, Adrian showed us so far? If you guys okay. have any questions, you guys can ask him or else like put in the chat. Hey, Adrian. Okay. Uh, my name is Anthony. I have a, have a quick question. Um, in terms of uh, conditioning yourself um, for like working in the industry, maybe a concept art or, uh, or just creating uh, digital assets, um, what's the kind of like the level that you're supposed to be producing? So for example, like these, these vehicles, like would they give you a day to create those three, those three vehicles or would it, would it be more like a day to create 20 of those vehicles? Uh, um, that's a good question. If, if I just sort of show you, I'm getting a bit lost here in all these windows. But, uh, no worries. <clears throat> so I, I like to work fast. That's just because I've been doing this so long, so long you know. Mm -hmm. and if you're a student, there's there's no reason to go too fast. If you, you start in the industry, you know, they probably will push you to do work as fast as you can. I, I, I know artists are quite slow, but they make really good work. Um, but for me, I like to lock out. This is pretty much like the... Um, I'm getting weird echo here. I don't know. But uh, you can hear the echo. <laughs> it's okay. Um, so this is very similar to those little weird vehicle or the little weird sort of webcam sketches, although these were just done in Photoshop. It's the exact same process. You just sort of you start with one, and then you, and after about three minutes, you look at it and go, okay, that's cool. Because it's digital, I can just copy this. Like this is just a pure silhouette, like no color, no nothing, just a pure block in of silhouette. I like the shape, so I copied it over, and I erased out more, more elements, and then I painted more in. Oh, okay, that's kind of cool. And these are little, just for fun, there's just little sort of speeder bikes or something you might see on a space station or something, small little bikes you would see on, you know, I don't know why, but whatever. And uh, then you, you like that. So then like, I copy this guy, I just duplicate it over here and painted this and modify it. So you, you can work really fast digitally, which is why I love it so much. Um, but in my job, you're, you're not given a lot of time. Um, you might get an asset to design, so like a drone, I think I did something like that recently, and you, you get like, they want to see something like yesterday, basically. So the faster you can do it, great. But if you're still studying, don't worry about it. Speed comes with experience. Um, you know, you have more experience with painting and photo bashing and whatever it takes just to get it done. And you will submit these and they will go, these are terrible. What were you thinking? But number four was pretty cool. Uh, so let's, let's go with that. Like, let's sort of, let's sort of push that further and then I would end up doing this one and I would end up doing a more detailed pass after that and I might have to do like a three-quarter view like this I guess and it's a bad example but you know you, you sort of you have to submit as many options as you can just so you can get approval because people you're sewing this to they probably don't really know what they want but they know what they don't want or something like that like they see it and go no that's not what I was thinking you're like oh, okay cool it would be nice to know what you're thinking before I started but they didn't really know until you showed them something like written in the script, it might be a little description of what the drone is or the droid or whatever the hell you're doing. But you have to sort of go with it and so, sort of go with your own, you know, just from all your studies and your practicing, there's no quick way of doing this. And if you, like just from my own personal experience, if you, if you spent like three hours painting this guy and you make it look amazing, and then you submit it for review and they're like, this is all you have, like this, that, we don't like this at all. And what, then what are you going to do? You know, so the idea of submitting as many as you can is to sort of whittle it down a bit and go, okay, this doesn't work at all, this doesn't work, but we kind of like this, and we like this color of this one, we like the wheels of this one, and then you know what to do. You know, it's, it's all about, you know, making your life easier. And once once you, once you they've seen things that, you, that they like, then you know exactly what to do. You can combine all these because they're, they're just pixels, you know. You can take elements and combine them, and, and then an hour later you have something to show. I hope I didn't go off topic there. So that's late now. No, that was good. That was helpful. So it's like all the stuff are very quick, but it's just that's just from experience. I would never worry about being fast. Just learn to learn your own fundamentals. Hey, Adrian, uh, there's a question from OJ. Uh, what's the name of the website that uh, generated the uh, random uh, shapes of shapes for your uh, vehicle studies? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Pretty cool thing. This was a. This was an app back in the early 2000s or something called Alchemy. Oh, yeah. Is... <laughs> I've used it before. It's a pretty fun software. Yeah, but it's just continued now. Oh, is but... it? 
uh, this is like a, a website version of it, so it's just web for me, well, well named. So in, in alchemy, you couldn't undo, which is the whole point of it. You, you make random shapes. It's like looking at silhouettes or whatever. So you're designing a creature from the front. Here's a little weird little face. And in, in this website, you can actually undo oh, that's it. That's nice. You know? So there you've got a little lizard face. Oh, whatever. You know? And then you just save it out. You can turn off symmetry. I don't really use symmetry. Well, I do, but not here. And it's sort of it's like drawing with the lasso tool in Photoshop, but it makes nice shapes, and you can sort of add some variation to it. So it's, now it's making even bizarre shapes. But, you know, but most artists, when they look at these shapes, they can go, "Okay, that's that's a freaking cool shape design, or whatever you're trying to do." And this helps you sort of give you ideas, you know. So then you just save this and bring it into Photoshop and paint it up. That just saves you a lot of time. Like again, for myself. If I'm staring at a blank piece of script, a blank piece of paper and I'm or screen or digital paper, and I'm trying to sketch something, I, I would sketch the most generic thing because it's sort of muscle memory and it's just what I do. So I use use photos and stuff like this and 3D or whatever whatever you need to do to sort of spark your imagination to do something that you normally wouldn't do. So yeah, they're awesome awesome little web app thing. Check it out. And uh, just before we finish, you know, like you should really kind of get more into like. Even as a as a two D artist, like I've been sort of getting into Houdini, which is the craziest software on the planet. It's the most difficult thing for an artist like me to learn. Uh, yeah, this is kind of where we're going in the future of map painting. So, learn learn Unreal Engine. <laughs> yeah. Hey Adrian, so are you gonna show uh, something else, or I can open the floor for Q and A? Uh, yeah, no, I think that's that's about all I wanted to show. Oh, sorry, okay. it was too. Sorry, it was too boring. <laughs> no, it was pretty good. Uh, I learned a lot of That's stuff. Uh, so it was pretty interesting. Uh, so guys, if you guys want to ask any questions, you can uh, ask him. Uh, you can ask him uh, through the chat if you're shy, or else you can ask him directly. So go for it. Oh yeah, that actually that, that actually reminded me of something. I mean, if any students are watching this, um, maybe even before or after this video is put up, I'm gonna probably link it on my YouTube channel. But I wanted just to quickly before we finish up. If any students are too shy to ask questions or whatever, that they can always just contact me. I'm always quite happy to look at students' work, give them some tips on um, just general tips on art, or you know, I can send some links to artists that I love and just the, the books that I've used, like Scott Robertson or whatever. There's a lot, lot of stuff out there, so please feel free to contact me on amorion at gmail.com. You know, hey, so is just it okay, like if I share your uh, LinkedIn ask LinkedIn too? So. Yeah, yeah, they can get me there okay. and they can contact me. So I'd be more than happy to talk to students about this in this crazy industry of ours. Okay, I'll just put it in the chat, uh, so don't worry. Mm, I don't want to get spammed or anything, so. Yeah. <laughs> so, hey, Jeremiah Sutton here. Um, I, I wanted to ask, when you guys are, when you're doing the actual um, a plate, and then you have a shot in the same scene, but you've done a kind of random background to it, how do you match that? for the next shot. Mm. That, that was the, actually the whole point of, um, that's, a, that's a good question because I didn't really explain that too well. <laughs> Where am I going? So like the whole point of doing these sort of shots like this, like I could have, you know, you're, you're given a job to design an alien planet. You're like, oh, awesome. I can design whatever the hell I want. Like, <laughs> alien planet, you know? So I could do, I could do big, big squiggly shapes in the sky and all these mountains are bizarro and all planets are circular and there's all spikes everywhere. It's an alien planet. It can be anything you want. But we shot this sequence, well, I didn't shoot it. Either. We shot in a, in a quarry here in Toronto. So it looked like this, like there was a beautiful rock structures, beautiful water, beautiful snow. So we used it and we we're like, okay, this looks freaking awesome. Like we just, we, we enhanced it. Like we made it look a bit more alien. And I, I won't spoil it for anyone who's seen the episode, but there's other alien structures in it that we didn't show in these shots. but. You have to match what's coming up next. You know, it can't just be bizarre or random sci-fi nonsense. It has to make sense. And because it was, I already had asset, a access to like the photo. Like when you're working in VFX, like you, you would have access to all those photos, like all those, mm. stuff. and you, they're just given to you. Like, and if you're, it's pretty easy to sort of count them together. Like this is not, you know, easy stuff. You know. So yeah, you're right. You have to sort of match the continuity and you can't go just do whatever you want you know you have to watch the 
the previews and they're blocking for the shots and see what's coming up. So that makes sense. Okay, so you are watching the previews for the shots and, and maybe like a little TV block out of what it's sort of supposed to look like. Yeah. And do you, have, do you have some sense of what the terrain is going to be? Oh, 100%. Yeah, it okay. makes, your, makes your job easier, you know? Yeah. It would take a million passes to get an alien planet approved if you didn't have something to work from. Um, plus, from my experience working in animation, you always watch the animatic. You always keep an eye on what everyone's doing. Like I'm very nosy, so I'll be I'll be looking in shotgun at what everybody's doing, like the modelers and text directors. So like, just because I like the show, I'm very curious about behind the scenes stuff. So I'll be watching what everybody's doing. So I notice something that somebody's doing. Oh, well, I could use that, and I know what's happening in the shots coming up because I've already watched them. You know, just out of my own curiosity. Mm -hmm. It's it's interesting to me. It's always interesting to see behind the scenes of a show that you like. Um, so I keep in top. I try and keep in top of everything. I don't want anything to be a surprise, you know. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Well, thanks very much for that. Appreciate it. Cheers. Oh, oh my accent was easy to understand, actually. No, oh, it is pretty easy. No? <laughs> very easy. <laughs> Forgot to say it was from Arden, but it's probably pretty obvious. I have a, I have a question for you, Adrian. Sorry, before you uh, jump in, Venky. Just how much three D uh, is necessary before jumping into Unreal? Like, as somebody who's primarily, like, a 2D artist, um, can you just jump in after with Photoshop and then, oh, Unreal? Or what, what would you need? Yeah, that's a, that's a good one, because I don't know what it would be like if you were a 2D artist and you're jumping straight into Unreal, how overwhelming that would be, because there's always, you know, like, modeling is one thing, but you also under have to understand of shaders and how all that works. And so it's, I wouldn't say it's easy, but uh, it's definitely, it would definitely be harder to jump in, I would recommend probably, you know, getting more comfortable with like Maya first or Blender or something like that. Like you would get a better understanding of tweaking PPR shaders or, you know, something goes wrong with, in Unreal. You know, it's it's easier for an experienced three D artist to kind of figure out what's happening. But 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 don't put let it put you off. Like just just jump in and do whatever. If it breaks, it breaks. You know, all all that's going to happen is it crashes. <laughs> so just bring in some Mega Scan assets and play around with the different tools and sculpting mountains and. You know, and you learn as you go, really. But uh, you're definitely better if you had some experience in other 3D packages, but you know, don't let anything stop you. Thank you. Hi, uh, it's OJ here. Uh, let me start, I mean, Kim's question has been on there for a bit, so I'll, I'll start with Kim's question. She's asking if there's a course or any artist you recommend to learn about matte painting or digital art in general for students. Yeah. Um, Sorry, I should have prepared this actually, but uh, map painting, it's hard to be like I'm more just in digital painting in general. You cannot go wrong with um, uh, Design Cinema on YouTube, like Feng Zhu. He is, maybe, with some, maybe we can update some links or, or again, if any artist wants to contact me, I have any proper link, but the Design Cinema on YouTube, he's one of the best concept artists since the beginning of time. He was on Star Wars and um, and he's like a video game guy. He, I taught, I learned more from his YouTube channel than I did of my like five years in college and all my years of studying myself. Just what he goes, what he talks about, and uh, just and it, whether it's matte painting or concept art, it's all the same. It's all the fundamentals, of perspective, and whatnot. So he he is definitely worth checking out. Uh, every he's got videos up there for the last ten years. So watch every one of them. Um, he's amazing. He's an amazing teacher. Um, but the other guy is Scott Robertson, who is also even more amazing, if that's possible. But I, I learned more from his books. <clears throat> he has two books. One, one of them is How to Render, which is invaluable. Um, it's, it sounds like a technical book that's aimed towards lighters, but it's actually aimed towards artists who want to try and show like a reflectivity or something. You're blocking in a vehicle and you want to show the surface, you know. And um, it also shows atmospheric perspective, how to quickly block in a scene and you're pushing elements back in space and whatever. That book is hugely hugely important to go through thanks adrian thanks for coming to our meetup and uh, you're so patient and explaining everything i learned a lot of stuff today about my training than any other day so uh, thanks for uh, coming here and yeah good luck with your future well, thanks for having me